ahead. All right, so we're going to move along, and I am going to discuss where to admit the acute complex stroke patient after thrombectomy. Uh, I understand this is not a trending topic on Twitter, but it's definitely very pertinent to our resource limited healthcare environment, especially as our ICU beds are at a premium. Uh, no disclosures. Uh, so quick outline. Uh, first, we're gonna uh, review a definition of a stroke unit. Uh, look at a couple guidelines, mostly from the AHA and the American Stroke Association. Uh, review some common ICU complications post-thrombectomy. Uh, look at some potential uh, criteria for ICU admission. And then lastly, look at uh, some possible benefits that stroke units might provide our patients. Uh, first, I want to start with a common clinical scenario. So a patient has just undergone a successful mechanical thrombectomy for a large vessel occlusion under monitored anesthesia care. He or she is a GCS of 14, has a blood pressure in a good range, 150 over 80, is on minimal oxygen, setting 96%, and has no infusions running. So you finish up the case, you're discussing, you know, where to send this patient. And the options are floor, which is going to be unlikely, a stroke unit, or the ICU. So let's look at the definition of a stroke unit. And the best definition comes from the European Stroke Organization. Uh, in fact, that's the only uh, definition out there. Um, but essentially, it's a dedicated, geographically clearly defined area, area or ward in a hospital. Uh, it's a place where stroke patients are admitted and cared for by multi-professional teams. So that includes medical, nursing, and therapy staff. This team has specialist knowledge and training uh, in stroke. Uh, and importantly, the team should be conducting weekly multi-professional meetings. And if you look at this paper, really, the focus of these meetings are on stroke education. So importantly, a stroke unit is not an ICU. So a stroke unit can be composed of a few different types of beds. You can have non-intensive beds, semi-intensive beds, such as, a, such as step down unit beds, where they can do continuous monitoring and do assessments and treatments every two to four hours. But it can also have intensive care unit beds where we can provide all the interventions we provide in the ICU, uh, continuous monitoring and assessments every hour. On the other hand, as we know, an ICU really only offers continuous monitoring for our sickest patients and our assessments and treatments are done every hour. Uh, who runs a stroke unit often depends on whether or not there are intensive care unit beds in it. If there are ICU beds in a stroke unit, there is often a neurointensivist involved. Uh, but if not, it can be, you know, run by a neurologist team, a neurology team, excuse me. And as we know, an ICU requires, in general, an ICU attending or physician involved in the care of the patients. Importantly for these patients, there is a minimum amount of monitoring required, so 24 hours post-procedure. These patients require some form of more advanced monitoring uh, in a, such as a step-down bed or an ICU bed. So moving ahead to some guidelines, uh, this is from the 2018 guidelines from the AHA and ASA, uh, looking at mechanical thrombectomy. Um, and just one important point, um, they do suggest a comprehensive peri-procedural care team. So that means post-procedure, uh, these teams require some element of more advanced care. Uh, looking further into these guidelines, uh, the use of comprehensive specialized stroke care or stroke units that incorporates rehabilitation is recommended. So by a show of hands, and this is more for my own curiosity, how many um, of your hospitals have specialized stroke units? Okay, so not so many. Uh, and is your critical care team a part of that unit? Uh, 
may be about the same. So let's look at some common ICU complications post-thrombectomy. Uh, so this is a busy chart. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to review some of our more common interventions. But we have to remember that these patients are often fairly sick. Remember, patients who undergo thrombectomy have large vessel occlusions. They might have bigger neurologic deficits. They might have had their stroke going on for up to 24 hours. Um, so there are a lot of ICU issues to address, but I want to focus on the bottom right, and I'm going to highlight some of these. Uh, you know, this is where uh, an intensivist might add value to these patients, aside from our common complications. You know, when to extubate the patient, when to perform a tracheostomy, a peg tube, dealing with infections, deciding on stress ulcer prophylaxis, dealing with pressure ulcers, uh, and ensuring patients have appropriate DVT prophylaxis. So what are the common interventions we see after, um, uh, after IVTPA and truthfully after thrombectomy as well? Uncontrolled hypertension requiring titration of IV uh, antihypertensives, vasopressors for hypotension, invasive hemodynamic monitoring, life-threatening arrhythmias, insulin infusions for hyperglycemia, BiPAP or mechanical ventilation for respiratory compromise, management of arterial bleeding from access sites, or airway monitoring for progressive decrease in mental status, management of cerebral edema and elevated ICP, uh, post-neurosurgical inventions such as uh, craniectomies, and lastly, management of seizures. So moving ahead, what might be some criteria for ICU admission following thrombectomy? Truthfully, we aren't that sure. Uh, most of our data comes from acute ischemic stroke patients who receive IVTPA. Uh, and interestingly, interestingly, a recent study developed a prediction model after thrombolysis for these patients for who might need an ICU. So this was a retrospective study out of Johns Hopkins. Um, so they developed a simple uh, score predicting critical care needs after thrombolysis. And the critical care needs are essentially come from that list I showed you a few slides before. This uh, same group created that list. And this ICAT score stands for intensive care after thrombolysis. The score is composed of four elements, male sex, black race, and systolic blood pressure and NIH stroke scale on presentation. So not post-procedure, on presentation. And what they found in patients who received IVTPA was if you had a score of two or greater, it predicted one of those ICU interventions with greater than 97% sensitivity. Again, this isn't specific for thrombectomy patients, uh, but we can probably pull some of these, you know, these recommendations uh, for those, that patient group. So what might be a reasonable list using the data we have for ICU indications post thrombectomy. GCS less than equal to eight, a severe stroke, which is defined as an N, having an NIH stroke scale greater than 17. A large MCA infarct volume, which suggests a malignant course greater than 145 centimeters cubed. Cerebral edema or intracranial hypertension. Post-op following decompressive hemicraniectomy. Seizures, brain stem dysfunction, intubation, mechanical ventilation, a threatened airway, pulmonary edema, and lastly, and probably the more, most common indication, persistent extremes of blood pressure, so greater than 185 or less than 90 systolic. Lastly, I want to discuss some potential benefits of having a stroke unit in your hospital. So this was a Cochrane review from 2013 looking at organized inpatient uh, or stroke unit care uh, for patients with acute ischemic strokes. And what they found was specialized stroke unit care results in improved survival, a higher probability of regaining independence, and a higher probability of returning home. Now importantly, if you look at the studies they used in this review, most of them are not patients who are critically ill. They're mostly patients who might go to a regular hospital bed uh, or a ward, uh, not an ICU. So what is a better study? This was a before and after study from 2015, published in Cerebrovascular Disease. This was a single center out of Sweden, 
uh, and they looked at the beneficial effects of a semi-intensive stroke unit. Uh, they compared that to an ICU plus a mobile stroke team, which was their previous model. So it was a before and after study. Before, they were sending all of their patients to an ICU and having a mobile stroke team available. And after they developed their stroke unit, they had all of their patients taken care of by the primary neurology team. And what they found was being in a stroke unit versus an ICU may actually be beneficial. They showed that the patients that went to the stroke unit had a lower probability of unfavorable outcome at three months, so essentially a modified Rankin scale. Why, they asked? Well, a couple reasons. Continuity of care by the primary neurology team, a more har harmonized neural rehab program, which is vital for stroke patients, comprehensive nursing protocols and treatment algorithms, and probably the most important, familiarity with stroke patients. So let's go back to our clinical scenario. Our patient just underwent a mechanical thrombectomy under MAC. He's overall pretty stable. Where should he be sent? Probably depends on your hospital system. There really are no guidelines right now to tell us, but it's going to be one of these two, and maybe in the future, more so a stroke unit. So some conclusions. Guidelines for major medical societies recommend some form of more intense monitoring for the first 24 hours post-thrombectomy. The indications for ICU admission following thrombectomy remain undefined, but our best guess probably comes from patients who receive IV TPA. And lastly, studies suggest a stroke unit benefits patients with acute ischemic stroke, and it may be a better, better alternative for monitoring in patients with relative indications for ICU admission. That's it. Thank you.